Plato said, not Plato, Plato. Plato said, how can a man be happy when he has to serve others? Gordon Gecko, do y'all know Gordon Gecko? One of the uh, not primary characters, but one of the characters in a movie in the 80s. Gordon Gecko, played by Michael Douglas, said, Greed is good. FanDuel Casino. Do y'all know FanDuel? FanDuel is an online betting uh, service. Some of y'all know, but you're pretending not to. (laughs) FanDuel Casino said, winning is the greatest feeling ever. And then it goes on and describes how it's better than catching car keys or something. It's it's better any other feeling you might have, better than catching a fish, which is terrible. I mean, how you? (laughs) They said winning, winning, as opposed to losing, is the greatest feeling ever. A rabbi who lived between the end of B.C. and the beginning of A.D., way back then, rabbi said, let us work to get the best seats of honor in this life and in eternity. A movie came out called Inventing Anna. And in that movie, it portrayed Anna, and Anna makes this statement. VIP is always better. James and John said, James and John, the brothers Uh, who were fishermen that God, that Jesus called to follow him, James and John, followers of Jesus, they said, Lord, grant us that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in glory. The disciples, all of them, not just John and James, but all the disciples on the road disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. Mark chapter 9, verse 34. There is within um, church culture, Christian culture, and non-church, non-Christian culture, this idea that VIP is always best, that what matters is the seat of honor, that it's better to sit at a, a, a roped off section where you are one of the people served than it is to be sitting in a place where you have to serve somebody. There is within the culture of the church and in the culture of Uh, Christianity and in the culture of non-church, non-Christianity, me first, everybody else takes second chair, third chair, fourth chair. In the generation in which I was raised, there was this mentality that said, you've got to take another step up the ladder so that you can be recognized, so that people can say, oh, there goes Billy Bob. He is somebody special, so that people will serve you. Beginning in Mark chapter 8, Jesus is teaching his followers what it means to follow him. Now, I want want to kind of clarify here. When we talk about being a follower of Jesus, we're talking about someone who has been changed by an encounter with Jesus Christ. Someone that, that has experienced a forever forgiveness for their sin by placing their trust in Jesus who died for their sin upon a cross and was raised from the dead to give them new life. Someone doesn't just pray a prayer, but really has experienced an alteration, a metamorphosis within themselves. It's portrayed in Scripture as someone who was blind spiritually and someone who sees now. 
Someone who was lost spiritually and in life, and someone who is now found. You see the transformation? We just read Ephesians chapter 2. It is the difference between someone who is dead and someone who is made alive. If you're a follower of Jesus and you can't say that I've moved from dead to alive, then you're not yet a follower of Jesus. See, being a follower of Jesus is not just following a set of rules or principles that Jesus lays out. It is being changed by him. Ephesians, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 kind of changed. If any person is in connection with Jesus, they're changed. You're a brand new creature. Old things passed away, all things become new, and all these things are from God, who's reconciled us to himself, brought us into his family. To claim, lay claim to being a follower of Jesus is to declare, I've been changed. So when we talk about being a follower of Jesus, and that's what Jesus was teaching his disciples and others, he, beginning in chapter 80, Mark chapter 80, he's saying, here's what it means to follow me. If you've been changed by your encounter with me, here's what it looks like. We've been looking at that and, 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 and walking with Jesus as he's making his way to Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, as he predicts in Mark 9, 30 through 32, in Jerusalem, uh, he's going to be killed. And then he's going to be raised from the dead. Uh, Mark 9, 31, he says in 32, he says, uh, uh, the son of man is being betrayed into the hands of, man, the hands of men. And he's going to be killed. And he's going to be raised from the dead. So Jesus is painting a picture of his own suffering and death for the disciples. And, and he has just declared that if you want to follow him, you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after him. So he's laying out the groundwork of what it means to follow him. And following him means that we live the way he lived. I, I don't know how many of y'all had some mentor in a profession. Um, uh, if you, uh, uh, when I was in college, I worked at a, uh, a place, a, a, a shop where, um, there was a lot of cutting metal and, um, welding and, uh, creating, um, platforms for the, uh, uh, oil industry in Southeast Texas. And, uh, I went out and I began my work there picking up cigarette butts off the shop floor. And that's, they thought it was funny. I did it. Um, and then because I did that so well, they gave me a rake. And then after I did that so well, it just continued. They let me punch holes in metal. That was a lot of fun because you got to step on a button and this machine would come down and punch a hole in that metal. And eventually they got to the place where they said, Eric, we want you to learn a little bit about cutting metal and welding. I thought, all right, now comes the fun stuff, right? I, I get to have the blowtorch, you know, I get to the, the, and I get to have the hood, pop it down and that's not what happened you know what they did they put me with somebody and so you watch him and all I did for the next several weeks was uh, just watch my coach my mentor and he would tell me what he was doing. He'd say, now you'll have to do this. And he also made it my job to grind slag off of metal and, and continue to punch holes in metal. And that was still my job. But, but he would let me do certain things. But as I was doing certain things, as I finally got to wear the hood and pop it down and do a little bit of welding, he said, no, you know, and, or yes. He was always coaching me. He was my mentor. Now, my job wasn't to do the job on my own because I didn't know what I was doing. My job was to follow the instructions of my coach, my mentor. I was his apprentice. That's what I did. You all have experienced that in business. You've experienced it uh, in theater. You're, you're a theater person. You, you know that there is the main players on the stage, and then there is the... The understudies. 
The understudy's job is not to take the lead. The understudy's job is to know the lead so that when they come up, they can do it. Jesus, who has changed our lives, if indeed you've been rescued by faith in him, rescued by God's grace through faith in him, if if you've been changed, then your job and my job is the same, and that is to learn from Jesus, to follow him. So every day, and by the way, none of you have arrived, and I haven't either. We're not there. We, We have not arrived. You haven't gotten to the place where you can do this stuff. Your job is, do this on your own. Your job, my job, is not to take the lead. Your job, my job, is to follow the lead. So today, we're learning about following the lead. And in a culture where the world says, or might say, or even you might say, VIP is always best, Mark chapter 9, verse 35, Jesus says, if anyone desires to be first... He must be servant of all and last of all. If we're going to be faithful followers of Jesus, you've been rescued by God's grace. You've been changed from the inside out. Then here is the principle that we must follow. It's one of many, but it's one that we must follow. A faithful follower of Jesus must serve. To follow Jesus means to serve. And if we're not on board with being a servant, then we're not on board with following Jesus. If we're not on board with following this simple command that he lays out, to be first of all, you must be servant of all and last of all. If we're not on board with that, if we want to keep on holding on to this idea, VIP is always best. How can a man be happy who has to serve others? If we want to hold on to that kind of principle, then we're not going to faithfully follow Jesus. But today, my prayer for us, for you and for me, is that we would have our minds blown by the good news that we can be satisfied, not by getting position or power, but by following the process that Jesus lays out. We can be satisfied, content, Not by getting recognition for ourselves and sitting in VIP, but rather as followers of Jesus, we will be content, satisfied, fulfilled when we serve others. The disciples in Mark chapter 9, you look at verse 33, 34, leading to verse 35, uh, the disciples are walking along the road. They've left Galilee. They're on their way to Capernaum. They're going through Galilee on their way to Capernaum. As they make their way, the disciples are debating among themselves who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Hey, who gets VIP? Who gets VIP in the VIP? And Jesus gets to Capernaum, they get to the house where they're hanging out, and Jesus sits down, he begins to teach. And here's the question, what were you all discussing on, your ro- on the road here? Now, he knew good and well what it was, but the disciples, they, they didn't really want to answer. They didn't want to answer because they were embarrassed. They were embarrassed because somewhere, as followers of Jesus, they knew what they were discussing was out of bounds. It was out of, out of sync with the character of Christ. They knew, I mean, they acted like uh, little boys whose hands were stuck in the cookie jar. jar. I could say little boys and girls, but I was raised with uh, three brothers, and we're the one, we broke the cookie jar. We didn't just, we just broke it. Uh, they, they, they got caught with their hand in the cookie jar, and G- when Jesus said, what were you talking about? And they were like, oh, no, I don't really want to talk about what we were talking about. And Jesus knew. And that led him to make this clear statement. You want to be first? You want to be great in the kingdom? Then here's what it looks like. You pursue greatness in God's kingdom by serving. You pursue greatness in God's kingdom by serving. Now, that message to the disciples is the message to us today. Please, don't don't get, don't miss what this is saying. Just just look at the red. Mark 9, 35. Just look at the red. 
If anyone wants to be first, he must be servant of the people he likes. If anyone wants to be first, he must be servant of the people in his life group. Certainly includes that. Sorry, includes the people you like. If, if anyone wants to be servant, he must be servant of the people in his church. And it includes that. Absolutely. But that's not what Jesus said. What did Jesus say? If anyone wants to be first, he must be servant of, what is it? What is it? All. all. Now, all means all. Done the work. I've studied the Greek. All means all. It, it means the people you know and the people you don't know, the people who you like and the people you don't like, the people who like you and the people who wouldn't walk across the street and spit on you if you were on fire. Do you understand how revolutionary this principle is? And it's not, it's not optional for a follower of Jesus. You can't say, opt out of this. Say, I'm going to be a faithful follower of Jesus, but I'm not going to serve the people that don't like me. No. We pursue greatness in God's kingdom when we commit ourselves to be servant of all. In a VIP is best culture, we put on the apron and we get down and we wash feet and we serve tables. That's what it means to be a servant. It doesn't mean to put on a shiny robe and walk around and say, hey, hey, look at me. It means I commit. Now, get the picture. It, it's hard enough to serve people who love you best and whom you love most. I said I wasn't going to share this one in 10.30. I'll share it at 10.30 because Edie's here. Yesterday, Edie, uh, doing stuff around the house, and she said, uh, Eric, uh, would you mind doing two things? She knows me very well because she, if it were indefinite, it would cause a response. But she said two things, and those were two very specific things. And I'm sitting on the couch, and it's Saturday. And it's football season. And I'm not saying that this was in my mind yesterday, but it could have been. Now, yeah, you walk through this journey with me. I'm watching TV. My wife asked me to do two simple things, things that I should do and things that I should want to do. But because of this ugliness inside of me, I can think, does she not know what it's football season? Does she not understand there's a game on? Does she not? Uh, uh, wh how, can, how can she do this to me? All she's done is ask me to take out the trash. That's it. That's all. And take out the trash. Sweep a little bit. That's it. it. Wouldn't take five minutes. Didn't take five minutes. But in my mind, I could have been thinking. Hey, Y'all been there, haven't you? The people you love the most, the people who love you best, They've asked for service, and we rise up and say, How, what, what? No, I can't do that. All the while knowing that it should be the delight of our hearts to do service for those who love us best and whom we love most. It should be the delight of our hearts. That's with people we know and love and who love us. But Jesus doesn't say just serve them. He says serve the people that we know and don't really like being around. The people who know us and don't really like us. We're supposed to serve them. We're not supposed to serve only the people in our life groups or only in the people in our church or only the people in our crew. 
We're supposed to serve people regardless their affiliation, their religious background, their ideology, their mentality, their perspective on us. We're called to serve them. Do you not understand how revolutionary this is? We'd like for this not to say all. We would like for this to say, uh, I'm a Republican. I only serve Republicans. And if you're a Democrat, you're out of luck. We would like to say that. Or I'm a Democrat and I only serve Democrats. And if you're not a Democrat, you're out of luck. Or I'm a Baptist. And if, if if you're not a Baptist, you're out of luck. I only serve Baptists. Or, or you see how we can tribe up, but that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says we're to serve all. Then he pulls a kid up into his arms to paint the picture even more. Look, look at what it says, verse 36 and 37. He says, it says, uh, Jesus took a little child and he set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, Jesus said to them, whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. Whoever receives me receive, receives not me, but him who sent me. And Jesus said, you look at this child and remember first century culture, old people looked at young people as if they didn't matter. You haven't earned the right to be heard. You haven't earned the right to speak. You're a child. Just sit over there. Be quiet. If we want you, we'll ask you. Jesus says, no, no, no. Service looks like this. Service takes someone who can do nothing for you and welcomes them. When we serve others like children... We honor God. He says, whoever receives me receives him who sent me. It is this honors him who sent me. It's a picture of honor. When we, when we serve even children, I say that, and it seems just silly to say it like that, but uh, there are even people in this church that kind of have that perspective that um, the children will have their time and their day when they grow up, and now it's not their time and not their day. That is an anathema to the mind and the heart of Jesus. I'm thankful that our church is committed to do all that we can to serve children. This is how we pursue greatness in God's kingdom. In our house, we have a dog. Her name is Lola. Lola is a chihuahua. And Lola thinks that she is queen of our home. This little thing goes around our house, lays where she wants to lay. This morning as I was leaving, this happens every Sunday morning, I, I leave um, and, and, uh, early, and as I'm leaving, um, I say goodbye to Edie. It's still dark in the room. I say goodbye to Edie, and, and Lola, who is there on the bed, growls and snaps at me. I've disturbed her. But Lola thinks she's queen of our house, and when, uh, if you were to come to our house, one of, she would respond to you one of two ways. First way is she would bark like a crazy person, letting you know you are not welcome. The second way she would respond is she might bark, but she would run and she would get her most prized possession, a little stuffed animal bunny. She carries that thing everywhere. It's gross. <laughs> Edie washes it on the regular, and Lola will, will groan and complain if she doesn't have it. But uh, Lola will either bark like crazy, letting you know you're not welcome, or she will go and get her prized possession and bring it and lay it before you as a gift. Let me be very clear. Most of you wouldn't get the gift. <laughs> I don't always get the gift. As followers of Jesus, he's calling us not to bark, but rather to give gifts of service to everyone we encounter. Not to try to repel people with our yapping, but rather to serve people with the heart of Jesus.
After all, this is what makes us look like Jesus. Mark 10, 45, Jesus said, the Son of Man has come not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. You realize, as followers of Jesus, we follow the example of our leader, our mentor, our teacher, our Lord, Jesus. If he, gave, if he came not to be served, but to serve, what makes you and me any different than that? We pursue greatness by serving. Second thing we see in this passage uh, is a, a, a continual theme. If we pursue greatness by serving, if faith, faithful followers of Jesus are going to serve others, then what gets between me and serving? You ever think about that? What, what keeps me from serving? So Jesus adds on to the teaching about serving with another teaching that tells us if we're going to serve faithfully, if we're going to follow Jesus faithfully, then we must deal with our sin ruthlessly. Let me just read it and then a couple of, a couple of thoughts about it. Beginning in verse uh, 42. He bridges the distance. So he's had the kid in his arms, the little boy, little girl in his arms, and he says, you receive this child in my name you receive me and him who sent me, you honor him who sent me. Now verse 42, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. Where worm does not die, fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to uh, uh, enter life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. Where worm does not die, fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire where a worm does not die and fire is not quenched. So uh, pretty, pretty stout language. And Jesus is saying, whatever connects you to sin, you need to cut that connection. He's, he's using hyperbole. And I feel like I always need to say this because I don't want anybody walking out of here plucking their eye out or chopping their hand off or cutting their foot off. He's using hyperbole. Uh, hyperbole is a gr grammatical or a speech device where you paint a big picture using big images uh, to get you to embrace it, right? So hyperbole. Um, he's not talking about literally plucking your eye out. What he is saying, though, is you and I need to deal radically and ruthlessly with the sin in our life. We need to, whatever connects us to sin and disconnects us from fellowship with God, we need to reverse that curse. We need to disconnect whatever it is that connects us to sin so that we can remain connected in fellowship with God. You can't serve others or God faithfully while holding on to sin. Here's what we do. Can I, can I help you a little bit? And, and I know this from personal experience. What we do is instead of dealing radically, ruthlessly with our sin, we re redefine terms. So Jesus says, clearly, uh, you do this or you don't do this. God's word says, clearly, you do this, you don't do this. This is sin. You don't, don't, don't fall prey to that. And so what we do, if we don't want to let go that sin, if we don't want to chop that sin off, what we do is we change terms. We say, well, God really didn't mean that. He didn't really want me to be unhappy like that. He wanted me to hold on to this sin. It, that's not really sin. That was culturally encased ideas. It doesn't apply to me today. We change terms so that we can hold on to sin. Now, uh, this is what happens in the de-churched and the re-churched and the unchurched and the you-church. It's not just the progressives and the liberals who are doing this. It's you. It's me. Well, he, he really doesn't mean that. I'm not going to put legalism on you, but here's what I, if I were to think about this in application, I'd take seriously this verse. If my 
cell phone is causing me to sin, I need to throw it away. It's better to walk through life without a cell phone than it is to walk in sin. Be disconnected from God because of my sin. Does that make sense? If television is causing me to sin, I need to rip it out of the walls and throw it away. Because it's better for me to walk through life televisionlessness than it is to disconnect fellowship with God. If my work is causing me to sin, it's I need to I need to quit. If my golfing buddy is always causing me to sin, I need to stop hanging out with him. Y'all see what I'm saying? See, my fear is that I don't deal radically enough with my sin. Now, God, forgive me for not being ruthless enough with my sin. The way we fulfill the mandate of serving others is we deal ruthlessly with our sins so that we don't disconnect from God. See, our connection with God leads us to be more faithful in serving others, even those that don't like us. Well, what Jesus did to introduce this idea of dealing ruthlessly with sin is he, he said about a child. He said, it, the same kid that was uh, on his lap, he said, whoever causes one of these little ones to stumble into sin... It's going to be better for you to be wrapped around the neck with a millstone thrown in the depths of the sea and drown. That's pretty serious stuff, isn't it? Okay. It's hard to serve people when you're causing them to stumble into sin. And we cause them to stumble into sin when we ignore our sin. Think of it this way. Our children, see me, I've got four daughters, got two sons-in-law, got two granddaughters, Nora, Lucy. And I've got, I've got my family. And my children know and have known, they know the sin in my life that I ignore. They see it eventually whether it's a bad attitude, whether it's arrogance or pride, uh, whether it's uh, putting uh, my sin above my relationship with God, whatever it is, they see it. Same thing's true for you, the people around you, the children in your life, grandchildren. If you're holding on to sin, not letting it go, and they see it, they know that. You know what we're teaching them? We're teaching them that it's okay to ignore certain sins in your life, that your relationship is with God is not as important as all that. And we wonder why it is that our children decide that they don't want to have anything to do with Jesus anymore. And we cause them to stumble into sin. By the way, the sin may be a religious pride. It may be legalism. You know, legalism can be sinful. There can be a hypervigilance of certain laws that have to do with your own personal preference that you teach them. I, I, it can be a multitude of different things. By the way, I don't know, and we were talking about this yesterday, I think, in my house. We were talking about um, purity culture of, of the generation right, before, right after me, purity culture in the church. And look, I'm all about uh, doing everything we can to help our uh, young people remember purity is a will, the will of God. But kissing, dating goodbye is not a biblical concept. It's just a book. And if you don't know the book, you can look it up. Nobody cares about it anymore. But it was part of that purity culture. I kiss, dating goodbye. Elevated it to the status of if you don't kiss, dating goodbye, then you're in sin. Well, that's not what the Bible says. That's what the book said. And the book might not even have said that. I never read it. But it's elevating our ideas to the point that if you disobey my idea about what the Bible says, then you're in sin. Look, the Spirit of God dwells within you as a follower of Jesus to teach you what the Word of God means. And if we will just obey what we know, we'll be fine. 
Today, God's calling us not to be a stumbling block because we won't let go our sin. Today, God is calling us to deal radically with our sins, sever our connection with whatever impedes our connection with God so that we can be faithful in following after him. So here's the application, just simple application to land the plane, really simple. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if that's who you are, you've been rescued by God's grace, then I challenge you to take your sin seriously and cut off connection with it so that you, as a follower of Jesus, can serve somebody. In fact, today, you leave this place. My prayer is that God would burden you. I mean, absolutely weigh you down with the heaviness. I've got to serve somebody. You leave this place, you go into the community in the seven cities, and, and, and you go to work tomorrow and the next day and the next day. You go to school tomorrow and the next day and the next day. You live your life, and every day that you live your life, my prayer is that God would overwhelm us with this deep yearning and burden. Oh, God, help me serve somebody today. Start at home. Get up off the couch, stop watching the football game, and serve somebody. We live in a VIP is always best culture. And one of the best ways that we can demonstrate the difference of being a follower of Jesus is by serving people, the ones that like us, the ones that don't. So today... Let's go serve somebody. Would you bow your heads with me, please? If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I ask you, I invite you to become a follower of Jesus. As I shared at the very beginning, following Jesus is not following a set of rules. Following Jesus is having your life changed by Jesus and then following a set of rules. And then following him, being, um, being in his steps having his heart. But it begins with a change that takes place inside of you. Put it simply, God made us to have a relationship with himself. But our sin has separated us from God. Your sin, mine. It's, it's created a barrier between us and God that we can't cross. And no matter how many times we try to do right and be right and make up for the bad stuff that we've done, we cannot build our own bridge to God. Our sin has separated us from God. So God sent Jesus. God, Jesus, who is fully God, became flesh and bone so that he might live his life without sin. Jesus came so that he might die. As I shared earlier, he died on a cross in the place of sinners like you and me to pay the debt that your sin and mine demanded and deserved. Jesus died for my sin. And he was raised from the dead to give me new life. Today, if you see your separation from God because of your sin, and you see what Jesus has done for you, and you want that, you want a forgiveness that never dissipates or disappears, you want a new life, a new heart, a new way of life, you want to be changed then today I invite you to call upon Christ. The Bible says if you call upon him in faith, trusting him, then he will rescue you. He'll give you a new heart, new life. In a moment, we're going to pray for you. We're going to pray uh, for every person in this room who is not yet a follower of Jesus that, that God, by his grace, would awaken the faith you need to say yes to him today. If you are a follower of Jesus, what sin do you need to radically deal with today? Let's deal with it. What commitments do you need to make to, com 
to determine that you will serve somebody. Oh God, open my eyes that I might serve someone. Oh God, burden my heart that I might serve somebody. Oh God, in this moment as we respond to your word, as you have clearly spoken the simplicity of your word, I pray, oh God, that for anyone and everyone in this room who is not yet a follower of Jesus, I pray that you would burden their hearts to say yes to Jesus today. By your grace, open their eyes to see their need for Jesus. By your grace, um, awaken their hearts to believe on Jesus. And by your grace, give them the courage to respond in repentance and faith to follow Jesus. Father, for me, Eric Thomas, for my family, for this church family, we who are followers of Jesus, oh God, don't let us leave this place holding on to sin. God, help for us deal radically and ruthlessly with our sin. And then, God, burden our hearts to serve. Not just the people we like, not just the people we know, not just our club, not just our clique, but God, help for us to serve all. Now be glorified as we worship you. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray.